here in the lecture room and everybody at the Zoom. Uh, I'm proud to open the first event in the series uh, History at the Edge, uh, which will start with uh, Dr. Milica Popovic telling us something about deserters. The, the, the title of the presentation is uh, The Silence of Saying No, Narrating Desertion, and I am really, really um, interested in hearing how was this process perceived in the 90s and in today, in today, and today uh, in the space of ex-Yugoslavia. Because I think that it is a question that no one in Slovenian historiography ever thought about, and it's also something that needs to be deeply researched. And I believe that my colleague is deep in the midst of the archival uh, and oral sources uh, research of this matter. So please, Milica, I will remove myself for now. And Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I might actually uh, already at the beginning lower your expectations uh, because I will be presenting something that is a project in the making. So it's not really a lecture presenting the project's results, but I'm at the very beginning uh, of this long journey. Um, and. Uh, trying to find the answer to the question, which uh, I agree, uh, I also believe is very, very important. But I want to start by saying really a big thank you to the um, Institut Zanovesius Godovino for having me uh, here for the last month and for giving me the opportunity to actually give this presentation. Um, so on the 20th of September, 1991, a reservist of the Yugoslav People's Army, Miroslav Milankovic from Gornji Milanovac in Serbia, committed suicide at the age of 51. He was mobilized the day earlier, and he was standing between two groups of fellow soldiers. One group has decided to actually obey the command to leave for Vukovar, and the other group decided to openly desert from the army. Milenkovic, being unable to make the decision, decided to commit suicide. Just three days later, on the 23rd of September, the same year, Vladimir Zivkovic from Valjevo in Serbia, drove his tank all away from the border, um, from the Croatian border and par parked him in front of the Yugoslav parliament in Belgrade in protest against the war. He was arrested for desertion and put into an institutional mental, uh, <clears throat> mental institution. Um, actually, Zivkovic uh, is still in Serbia today working as a taxi driver in Valjevo and unavailable for public. So along a number of the examples uh, that we probably have all heard through various media or personal stories about the wars in the 1990s, about desertion, draft dodging, draft resistance, there is the question that kind of led me to start the project, and that is why there hasn't been so much more research about it. And I started at first really trying to think about it. What does it even mean? What is a desertion? What kind of acts does this comprehend? Because as we know, this is actually a phenomenon which has been existing ever since there has been uh, obligatory conscription and armies itself. It has been researched by the military studies, military sociology, um, philosophy sometimes, trying to understand what does desertion as such mean. Popular culture, of course, also has um, discussed the phenomenon, but it also has shown that there is a myriad of profiles that kind of prevent a simplicity of approach. And in some of the works uh, that I have came upon, there has been a different uh, kind of approach, trying to understand it either as a formula of betrayal, meaningful socio-political act, an ambivalent act, uh, one of the ordinary vices, as Judith Clark would say, actually treason itself. And then again, Brianna Dumont reminds us, those British subjects who wrote the Declaration of Independence were only traitors until their treason succeeded. Then they became the new authority in America, cloth in every bit as much respectability as the British governors whom they overthrew. And we now respect them as our great patriots. So understanding desertion and draft resistance is ultimately dependent, of course, on the societal hegemony paradigm and the current political elite's understanding 
and their mainstream memory discourses. I need to make a disclaimer, of course, that in the talk and in the presentation, I use desertion and deserters, but it is encompassing also the acts of draft evasion and draft dodging, just simply for the simplicity of talking of not uh, all the time kind of <clears throat> repeating myself. And what is most uh, important in this sense is that the act of desertion shows up as a counter narrative being disruptive to the implicit collective memory. What does mean implicit collective memory? The collective memory that has been self-understood, that has been just plain reason, and that has been the fact that in all of the nation states which do have obligatory conscription, when the army is calling, when the nation state is calling, we say yes, we go to the army and we defend our nation state, fatherhood or a motherland. So, among the research that has been done, of course, the question of deserter has been mostly researched uh, in cases of Germany and Austria. Um, as we know that uh, Adolf Hitler himself was demanding a death penalty for all deserters in Mein Kampf, it is estimated that there was about 15,000 death verdicts carried out on deserters until the end of the Second World War. The introduction, however, of deserters into the German public debate waited until the 1980s with a strengthening of the anti-war movements and the pacifist movements everywhere, um, also including, we know, uh, here in Slovenia and Yugoslavia. And despite having proven that not all deserters were active political opponents to the Nazi regime, uh, collective memory of the unified Germany primarily depicted them as victims of the Nazi judicial system and persecution. Legal rehabilitation started only in 1997, and it actually has been finalized in 2009, when for the first time deserters were rehabilitated wholesale without the individual cases approach. Marco Draghi, however, claims that actually did, did not have a significant impact onto the memory culture, nor gained a public uh, debate's prominent place, so to say. In Austria, it is somewhat of a similar situation. Uh, in 2009, the Austrian parliament rehabilitated the victims of the National Socialist Military Justice, and in 2014, in Vienna, a first monument to Verhand deserters has been erected. As you can see in the photos, the monument has been placed on Heldenplatz in a bit of a corner of a Heldenplatz, and this, following the way it has been constructed today when we pass through, it mostly serves the purpose of tourists actually taking a break while looking uh, the the rest of uh, the magnificent and monumental Heldenplatz uh, itself. So similarly to Germany, even though some of the reports say that there has been about 50,000 uh, deserters in Austria, the authors uh, like Pirker and Kramer claim that lacking a cohesive identity, uh, the deserters did not play a significant role in the national memory culture. So the act of deserters and draft resistors has, of course, a multitude of roots and reasoning behind, which makes it a very difficult object to be researched, maybe even understood as a whole. But the remembrance of this act within specific historical and national context plays significant role in memory politics, either by epitomizing it as the ultimate ethical act or shamefully resting it into the oblivion. And what about the Yugoslav Wars? So the project that I hope to uh, conduct actually is being situated within the Yugoslav Wars from 1991 to 2001. And um, as we all know uh, very well, um, the aim is to situate it in the narratives which are still by the political elites and hegemonic memory narratives, really naturalizing, so to say, ethnic hatreds like Pavle Levy has been explaining, um, and also trying to show how the elites were using the violent conflicts as a tool to demobilize the moderates um, and the Yugoslav populations. So seeing nationalism as a tool uh, for hegemony struggles rather uh, as than its cause. And of course, in such a context, the high desertion rates do not necessarily come as a surprise. 
but they still remain counter narratives which are unwelcome by the political elites because they try to break the discourses on ethno-national unities and thus are being silenced. So when one starts researching the Yugoslav wars and the case of desertion, what is really interesting to see is that even all these 30 years later, it is very difficult to come across significant amount of research being conducted. Actually, there is some of the reports mostly conducted by international and non-governmental organizations, and the numbers just fly around. The numbers that we can find in all of these reports go from 30% up to 90% desertion rates in Serbia. One could kind of assume that probably this shows the difference within Belgrade and the rest of Serbia, maybe the smaller cities, there must be some geographical uh, differences in that sense. Uh, but we did not manage to find any of the data which actually finally concludes the desertion and the draft um, eviction rates. So as you can see, uh, there, there are numbers uh, which uh, are enormous, which call for research, but are not final. Even uh, discussing the numbers of people who have fled Serbia, um, even in the early 90s, it was uh, over 100,000. Then, of course, uh, it remains to be seen, are those men, are those men who were actually trying to evade um, serving in the army and participating in the war, or were there other reasons for leaving the country, etc., etc. Beyond the two most famous cases from the beginning of the talk, actually some other desertion acts have been documented. To 24th of September 1991, several thousand reservists of the Yugoslav People's Army deserted the front line in Slavonia in Croatia and demonstrated in front of the assembly hall in Valjevo. Protests in Vojvodina took place almost in every small town with the most well-known of the Zitzer Klub, organized in 1992 in a 2000 people's village in northern Vojvodina that lasted for 93 days with up to 1,200 people attending some of the meetings. There are cases of 7,000 deserters in Kragujevac, 700 in Smederevo, 700 that came back from Slavonia, threatening to shoot the general that was actually wanting to arrest them for desertion. 150 came back from Osijek, 700 deserters in Gornji Milanovac, all in Serbia, even Vevo the notes a mutiny in Banja Luka in 1993, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what is really interesting to see that there is a variety of numbers and no comprehensive research trying to understand what has been really happening. Most of the research that has been dealing with the issue and the places where these reports appear is either in non-governmental reports or some uh, little research that has been looked at it through the lens of anti-war protests. But also beyond being only an individual act or a collective act of the soldiers themselves, the assertion in Yugoslav war was a family act as well. Uh, we probably all remember the cases of the Serbian mothers who were coming by buses to Slovenia trying to uh, take their sons out of the armies while they were serving their uh, regular uh, military service. 2nd of July 1991 in Belgrade, there was about 300 parents who broke into the parliament demanding the return. And uh, there is one publication here in Slovenia about the case of Slovenian parents who've been trying to take uh, their son sons out of the Yugoslav People's Army throughout um, actually the rest of Yugoslavia. And of course, in order, in order to react to all of these cases, the regime, especially in Serbia, re reacted violently. There are some of the reports that even up to 25,000 combatants in Bosnia and Herzegovina were the refugees that were forcefully taken from Serbia to the military front. There have been reported incidents of torture, show trials, negative media campaigns, and then um, maybe uh, one of the most famous cases, the case of General Vlado Trifunovic, um, who waited for 14 years for the annulment of the treason verdict because in 1991 he surrendered the army barracks in Varaždin to the Croatian forces, sending home about 250 young soldiers. 
He was f convicted for treason in Serbia. At the same time, he was also convicted as a war criminal in Croatia. And until the end of the, his life, he was trying to be very vocal about his decision um, that he made in Varaždin in 1991. Uh, also bringing to, to, to the discussion a very important element when we try to understand the act of desertion, uh, saying one should bear in mind that I have been left with poor children only. All other children, all other soldiers who had some property or someone they knew at a position of power or some connections, they were taken out earlier. They ran away, they did not come to Varaždin. So the class element is extremely important in understanding the act of desertion and this decision. But then again, of course, even if we understand that the act of desertion was not for everyone, a political descent necessarily with a political regime, that there was a number of different reasons why somebody would um, under, uh, decide to remain in the army or go to, to the army once um, invited, it is important still to understand that, for example, in the aftermath of the war, the, the last Yugoslav defense minister, Veiko Kladievich, uh, in his book claimed that the draft resistors and deserters were one of the key factors for undermining the capacity of UNA in the Yugoslav wars and thus possibly contributing to the shorter duration of the conflict and the end of the war. And then again, in the war as it was the one uh, in Yugoslavia, the memory and deserters is seen and perceived very differently depending on what kind of deserters are we actually talking about. And here in the photo, we can see a commemoration that was held in 2019 in Zagreb by the Croatian government of Rudolf Pereshin, who used to be um, a pilot uh, for the Yugoslav People's Army, deserted uh, by flying his MiG to Austria. Um, and then later actually participated on the side of the Croatian army, was killed uh, at the very end of the war in Croatia in 1995. And since in 2019, the Austrian government has returned uh, the plane of MiG-21, uh, I think, uh, to Croatia. There has been an official commemoration ceremony where Andrei Plenković, the prime minister of Croatia, stated the message that Peresin sent in 1991, not only to the Croatian people, but to the whole world, was a message of freedom, courage, strength, bravery, and patriotism. And discussing and having in mind a very different message of freedom and bravery, there was a number of anti-war activists in Serbia that already through the 1990s have demanded commemoration of deserters from the Yugoslav wars, like Stojan Cerović and Women in Black, demanding a monument to an unknown deserter, which hasn't actually been built to this very day. So the only commemorative activities to the deserters who did not participate um, in Yugoslav People's Army or um, uh, in any of the paramilitary formations um, of uh, the Serbian government in the wars have been organized in Belgrade. It started with 2010, actually an exhibition being inspired uh, from the story of, of Vladimir Zivković, where art collectives Škart and Art Klinika, together with Women in Black, organized a street action, we are giving you back the tank, in front of the Assembly of the Republic of Serbia. And the performance and questions claim themselves, we are giving you back the tank, highlights a marginal and almost forgotten act of disobedience, questioning the criteria which determine what is included or excluded from history. Celebrating a war deserter, this performance takes in the foreground the figure of anti-hero par excellence, contrasting the usual commemoration of combatants and war heroes. Undermining established narratives, it asks us to think about the way history is written, some events are glorified and others forgotten. Some individuals become protagonists and other minor characters. And then in 2013, uh, in one of the squatted um, industrial places, which does not exist uh, anymore in Exfilm at the outskirts uh, of Belgrade, there has been an exhibition in the name of Praise of Deserters. Um, it has presented a number of artworks dealing with the act of desertion and war resistance in Serbia in 1990s by Duck Theater, Nikola Jafos, Rajan Veljevic, Women in Black again. As presented on the website, it says, disclosing a narrative of anti-war engagement 
This exhibition investigates the civil protests in Belgrade, highlighting the opposition to the rise of nationalism and militarism and the forms of politically engaged art and performance which emerged from this context. The title refers to the deserters of Yugoslav wars as iconic figures of the decade, whose act of disobedience undermines the myth of war heroism and symbolically represents the anti-militarist drive of the whole civil protest. This curatorial project in interrogates the generative tension between live performance of protest and archival reconstruction, questioning the way history is constructed and narrated. Some of the references to the act of desertion and draft evasion have also appeared in the museum of the 90s, which has been presented just uh, recently um, in Belgrade. Although uh, the organizer of, of the exhibition and the museum um, have claimed that also even there, it has been difficult to reach out to the deserters themselves and collect some of the individual narratives. So certainly not to forget that these kind of anti-war narratives within which the act of desertion so far has been commemorated, have continued to travel. They did not appear only within Serbia. They continued to travel the post Yugoslav space. In 1992, there was a group of rock musicians um, and uh, they, Rim Tutu Tuki, I never knew how to say it um, when I was a kid and that remains a challenge even today. Um, and they had a very popular song, um, Peace, Brother, Peace. Um, and interestingly enough, in 2017, when in Croatia, there was a discussion about the possible reintroduction, um, actually, um, of uh, the obligatory military service uh, in Croatia, one of the um, anti-war resistance uh, and anti-militaristic uh, kind of presentations was that the same um, verses from the same song have appeared on Zadar Fortress is prod Shlema Mozga Nema. So trying to kind of understand what is this story of the Yugoslav deserter and why is this relevant? Until now, I've been just trying to kind of depict what is the context within which we have even uh, any kind of references to the act of desertion and draft resistance. And of course, the political space remains closed to many of the mnemonic communities. Le David has been uh, talking about the problematics also of even the war wet veterans and their place in the memory narratives of the post-Yugoslav space. Um, and certainly, as, as the political elites try to, to um, continue the, uh, the ethno-national uh, positioning, this narrative of resistance of participation in the Yugoslav wars uh, remains hidden, so to say. Another important um, element is that it also could help us actually show uh, all the panorama of various reflections of men and their families in the post-Yugoslav space, trying to understand uh, and giving us a further insight into the conflict societies today. So the story of the Yugoslav deserter um, really aims to understand the mnemonic community of deserters, so to say, and primarily through the lens of memory studies and political sociology. How do we remember desertion and draft resistance from the 1990s today? Important to say, uh, and especially here, I am not a historian. I'm not aiming to conduct a study of the history and to establish the exact facts and numbers uh, about desertion. And also, I'm not trying to conduct a sociology of anti-war movements. What would be really interesting for me within the project is not to focus on the deserters whose desertion has translated into anti-war activism, but exactly to try to look into the populations who did not become anti-war protesters and activists, but nevertheless have taken the decision to desert or not to evade or resist the draft. So really kind of trying to see how the hegemonic memory politics and the public space throughout the temporal shifts of the discursive representations and individual and family memories, in a certain way, these multidirectional memories define the implicit memory frameworks. And then uh, there remains the question, how to do it? 
Um, what would be interesting for me is to try to conduct the study in all of the seven republics um, of former Yugoslavia that is, of course, dependent of if, which, how much uh, money do I manage to get for the project and if uh, that will be feasible, but I think it will be very important in order exactly to show the whole complexity of the different interplays of the memory cultures towards the different uh, deserters themselves. And then the question is also, who is the deserter? As we already spoke a little bit, this includes all the men who have fled the country, who have hidden from the draft, who have maybe directly cheated or lied um, in certain communities within Belgrade. Almost everybody has a story how their mothers or grandmothers or parents have been lying, that they are not home, that um, there is uh, one of the urban legends, uh, father sending a written note to the Yugoslav People's Army saying that his son will not come to the army because his father does not allow him to, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so really trying to see where are these borders and what does desertion and draft evasion mean in a certain sense. There is, of course, a specific question of contentious uh, objectors, uh, which might be a very different category. And then, of course, the question of the deserters themselves, people who did find themselves in serving uh, the army already or even being taken into the war and then deciding to leave at some point with a very big um, importance of understanding the difference between the so-called regular soldiers who have undertaken the act and the generals for which um, the act had a much more significant um, consequences um, at least. And then, of course, the question of the deserters uh, from the Yugoslav People's Army, who then took, have taken part into some of the national armies um, or um, paramilitary formations, remains the question, what do we do with the police forces? We know that police forces have actually very actively participated in the Yugoslav wars. In some of the reports that I have found, there is a, a number of 2,500 policemen who have lost their jobs in Serbia because they have um, rejected to go to Kosovo during conflict. Um, and so far, what uh, is the only thing that is 100% sure to me um, is that I want to look into the deserters who did not become anti-war activists, but also who did not return to war to any of the armies or any kind of further pursuance of military or police activities. How to do all of this? Uh, of course, there is a, a number of methodological paths that one needs to take upon, uh, especially because the temporal shifts of the discourses on desertion are important in order to understand the memory narratives. Um, it is important to understand also how it has been presenting during the wars uh, and later. Uh, regarding the archives, as it has been uh, expected, uh, there is nothing, or at least Officially, there is nothing. Um, so I did uh, receive finally uh, an official reply from uh, the Slovenian archives saying that they don't uh, have anything on the topic uh, with a warm recommendation to contact the Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Interior, uh, which I did do and I'm waiting uh, for their uh, replies. Uh, there is an assumption that probably something uh, more substantial will be existing in the military archives in Serbia, uh, because uh, there are at least the numbers that they were obliged to release once the amnesty law has been adopted in 2003. Um, there are numbers about 26,000 uh, people who have uh, actually been subjected to amnesty um, after being convicted for, for desertion throughout the 90s. But altogether, uh, of course, in a project like this, uh, we cannot rely a lot on uh, receiving the, the exact data, which gives an even bigger importance um, of having the two paths of understanding all the other kind of archival materials, the non-governmental, the digital ones, and especially the media. Uh, because most of the reports will be found uh, within the, the, the media archives. Um, some of the importance uh, could be given to the policy and legislative frameworks. Uh, here, most importantly, I think, um, especially to the references that Boan Alexa was giving um, in his work um, about the situation where, for example, during the NATO bombing in 1999, 
um, NATO has been um, dropping leaflets um, to Serbia, inviting uh, Serbian uh, soldiers and policemen to desert uh, from the army to stop the war. And yet at the time, none of the EU countries and NATO countries were providing visas or mm-hmm. asylum refugee status to people who have deserted. Um, uh, the only information so far uh, that seems to be contradicting this is that at least in the beginning of the 1990s, Italy was the only country who was issuing special humanitarian uh, residence permits also on the basis of not wishing to participate in the war, but this is uh, something yet further to be uh, looked into. Um, And then, of course, as the major uh, data collection would be the individual, the family interviews with the ground theory approach, seeing where actually um, this will further lead me. And as a girl can only dream, um, this is uh, something that actually would be a beginning of a beautiful friendship, the Yugoslav project would be the very first step um, in something which I would like to develop further, uh, giving it a transnational and transtemporal, actually, uh, perspective. So uh, looking into the memory narratives of deserters, comparing very different cases, um, case of Austria and Second uh, World War, which is interesting because it is one of the most prolific case studies. Uh, The majority of, of literature on these questions does exist and relates to to Austria. The case of France and the Algerian war um, is particularly interesting. The archives have opened only in 2021, so there might be uh, a number of materials actually just uh, coming out now. Um, There is also the practical uh, reason of of my accessibility to these materials. And also um, in a number um, of the very little um, that I managed to research so far, um, but um, as, as you probably know, there has been a lot of resistance within France uh, against the Algerian war. And there are some reports that in a similar way that Milosevic was avoiding later on to use Belgrade uh, to mobilize um, soldiers, but rather looking um, into the smaller towns throughout Serbia. In France, something similar in the 60s during the Algerian war was happening, um, that the army was giving a number of reasons for people not to go um, in order in, to try to appease the protest uh, against the war itself. Um, and being a political scientist also, uh, the matters of actuality um, are something that I think uh, would be interesting to add. And that is the, the case of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, Once again, uh, no data so far. There have been some social media uh, reports appearing, which we don't even know if uh, they they are uh, fully um, true or not uh, about the numbers. And uh, only on the anecdotal level, which we know is the high numbers of of young men who are, for example, currently in Belgrade in the attempt to to evade uh, being uh, invited to the army um, in the war um, in Russia. So um, altogether, actually, I think that, especially given that there is no official data, that archives remain inaccessible, um, and that these narratives remain kind of silenced, it's important to find a way to uncovering them, because they are hiding these cracks in the monolith narratives of good and bad guys in the wars, victims and victors. Mm, and in a certain way, desertion is an act that the hegemonic memory are trying to forget. And I believe the silence needs to be researched. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, and before I ask if anyone has any question, I previously forgot that the date of this lecture was very well chosen, since today is actually a national holiday, the day of sovereignty, uh, the day when uh, uh, celebrating uh, the day when the soldiers of Yugoslav People's Army finally left Slovenia. So it's ironically a day when we so kind of celebrate desertion of their stand posts. Mm. One thing. The other thing that I just remembered is I once listened to Peros image, maybe not the most 
let's say, a reliable source for everything, but uh, he once told that in the mid-80s, the situation in Yugoslav People's Army was also problematic because more than 20% of the war conscripts were actually out of Yugoslavia at the time. So <laughs> there is also a question whether that uh, fact that most of many conscripts were abroad was just a case mm -hmm. of desertion or was it the fact of life? Uh, and there was a third thing that I now forgot about. So. Um, any questions? I think it was quite a topic that could warm up a debate. I have a question. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. It sounds very, it sounds very promising as a project, so it will be interesting to see what it holds. Um, uh, could you please explain a bit further why have you decided to look, uh, look at the searches? Who did not involve into any kind of any war movements after this act? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think that um, for me there there was of course the question of the research gap that uh, this is really a community nobody has researched so far. So the scarce research we do have on the act of desertion, we do have it through the lenses of anti-war protesters. Uh, and the second question, uh, the second issue, which um, is uh, actually crucial for me, is the fact that there was a large anti-war movement. But the number of anti-war activists, um, especially in Serbia when we discussed that, uh, have nonetheless, as always, remained in a certain way marginal. But if at the same time we're discussing about numbers of 90% people who uh, evaded the draft or did not participate in Belgrade. Not all of them became anti-war protesters. Not all of them ended up in women in black or in the streets or uh, singing um, in the rock bands. So, so I think that in order to really understand what did the decision mean and what does it mean today for all of these people, we need to expand the target group, so to say. So really to look into the ordinary, so to say, person who just decides I'm not going into this war. And it is a question that um, why the grounded theory approach, I think, is needed, because it will only through the, the, the fieldwork that uh, some of the important topics and, and, and uh, issues are, are going to, to appear. Um, but when I was talking at one of the conferences um, uh, about the project, um, there was uh, someone who asked, yeah, but that, why is this relevant if they are not anti-war pro protesters? Because, I mean, then it's just some people who didn't want to die. And this is actually what's important for me, because I think you cannot say just some people who didn't want to die for the state. I think that there is an important political significance behind that decision. Um, and it's interesting to see that this hegemonic implicit memory um, narrative and discourse um, understand that, well, it's not really important if somebody just doesn't want to die and does not become a through anti-war hero. But um, it's, it's very often, and as Kadievich says, that this did have an impact on the war itself. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from um, uh, Zoom audience. Okay. Urška Strle is asking, uh, I'm quoting, I might have missed it, but is there any numerical estimation of how many people deserted from the YLA? YLA? Also, is there any leaflet left as a material evidence of stimulating desertion? Um. So the, the numbers are all over the place. I was, I was talking about it. They're, they're, interestingly enough, really, really very diverse numbers uh, coming out. Uh, what we know is 2001, so probably something that could be considered um, as most correct uh, in terms of the ones who have been convicted of desertion is 26,000, the ones that have been pardoned 
with the amnesty law. That is the only data that we can have and would claim, would certainty claim that, okay, this is the number. Probably there would need to be some adjustment. I will need to go and see in the judicial archives if there were some additional um, amnesties that were taking place later. Uh, but this number does not cover all the other cases that we were discussing. So people who would leave, people who uh, were hiding from, from, from draft. So, so no, there is no uh, number and probably it won't be um, even possible to have one final number of, of people who deserted. So, so, so that's uh, what makes it fun. Um, regarding the, the leaflets, I don't have... Uh, any knowledge about this, but I could easily imagine that there is something to be found somewhere in Serbia, um, because I even remember myself that there, there were a lot of leaflets uh, being sent from, from, from NATO planes during the bombing of different uh, messages. Um, so, so yeah. yeah, I could imagine women in black should have something, but I just started um, the very initial research first here now, so... Serbia is yet to be explored. Thank you. And the message for Rushka is there are numbers, but there are too many of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is that is probably one way. But, but, but it's really interesting to see. I mean, that, that that's why even in itself, um, one of the methodological and, and, and uh, issues is, of course, to say who is even the draft evader. Because, okay, for deserter, we know that needs to be somebody who is already in the army and who left, but for the draft evader, what about people who left before the invitation came? And so it is only their own personal perception that the reason they left Serbia was not to go in the war. But is it really, they didn't, they weren't even invited yet. So at, at which point do we actually start including uh, the people into the research group? Um, so yeah, so a I lot guess, of questions. I guess is their perception is also important how they evade it. Uh, exactly. Why did they left Serbia? Exactly. I don't want to go to war, so I left before I get the note. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Draft dodging, actually. Yeah. We, that, that's the, the case. I mean, we were talking here a little bit about Serbia, a little bit about Slovenia, let's say Croatia. Uh, were a very different way of how the war actually uh, went to. And in 1995, with uh, Oluya moments, people who knew were trying to leave Croatia at the time to mm. touch the draft, but then Croatia had to close down the borders. That happened yeah. days before the actual uh, military operation. So what were those people who actually were just evading the draft at the time. Yeah. Those numbers would most probably never be known. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, in Croatia, uh, one, there was re relatively recently this, this article in Novosti and the journalist was saying that it was almost impossible for him to find uh, people who were willing to talk uh, about, uh, even though there are uh, some assumptions that there were significant numbers. In Croatia, there is also the, the, the interesting case of people who volunteered for the Croatian army for the war in Croatia, but then did not go when they were invited to participate in the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so, so yeah, there is there is really a, a multitude um, of decisions that have been taken. Sorry, I'm here as a voice for. Uh, Please. Is there anyone else? Ima, there, Anna. There, Anna. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Yes. Maybe yes. just to continue because it's the same line. Uh, thank you so much. It was really, really great. And I love that idea that you not use this idea of desertion as kind of a, a heroic act or some act who can dismiss you totally, like we always have. So I really like this emphasis of ordinary results or ordinary you know, motivation behind why people. Yeah. Uh, but actually, just to connect with this, I was thinking about, you know, very complex situations like in Bosnia, because you have people who are mobilized by, let's say, three sides. How then you will, I mean, this would be something which is very, you know, difficult also to, to research mm -hmm. and talk about. It, it, do you have any strategy to discuss this? Because you said that you want to uh, make comparative mm -hmm. um, 
That, that that's why so far the most productive is is this kind of decision of people not to participate in any of the war activities. So 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 at the moment of regardless of the complexity and the difference of the situations. So if, for example, in Slovenia they left Yela from regular military service, came back, didn't go into Teo. Um, if uh, they were invited from whichever of the armies, but did not respond, evaded, hid, whatever, and then until the end of the war, any of the wars did not participate in military and police but activities. Of course, of course, of course. Of course. And, and that is something that that, that that perspective needs to be taken into account when analysis the data. I think that is an additional reason why I really don't want to, I didn't go into the anti-war and this heroization because um, there is no wish in any way to have a normative, ethical depiction of the act itself. But just really research into what did the act mean and how do these people understand it today by themselves and within their families in this wider context of the act which has been forgotten. No. Can I just, because it's connected, how are you planning to find these people? Snowball sampling. Um, it's, um, I, I mean, I, have ex I belong to a generation which was growing up uh, throughout the wars. Um, I mean, uh, my, my own grandmother was uh, pretending, or at least it's the family myth, I don't know if, if it's true, but she was pretending to be already senile, and every time they would come to call for my brother, she would be telling them that she doesn't have a grandson, and she doesn't remember any family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so once it starts, I have been conducting similar snowball sampling generational type for my PhD thesis. Um, and I don't know, I've been living in Yugoslavia for the last 40 years, uh, which also kind of, I think, um, helped have the contacts. But um, yeah, that's going to be also part of the fun journey. Okay. Yes. Um, now I need. It's not for. It's not for my question, but it's a question of um, Jovana Mikhailovic Trbols, and it's a very interesting question. I will quote. Not just question. It's also uh, uh, an opinion. Congratulations for a comprehensive approach to the topic, both relating to memory studies and political science fields. You are obviously pointing to very heterogeneous wartime experiences that defy these nationalistic hegemonic narratives. What are you ex your expectation or hypothesis? What kind of political agency you expect to find among the draft evaders and draft dodgers? What do you expect? It's, it, it's, it's a very typical question. I, I suppose your question yourself the same. Yeah, um, and, and it's actually part part of the the, the problem, especially within politi uh, among political scientists who keep asking me for hypothesis, 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 um, and I keep being stubborn as a memory scholar, sometimes saying no, you know, ground, no, ground, ground. Brownfield, let's see what happens. Um, we, so it, as historians, we feel you. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> um, I think that. And also for this, my own positionality, which might help access to the field, but um, also then needs to be, I really think trying to enter the situation and research the situation and then see what happens would be the most productive approach. I don't want to imply any kind of agencies to these people until I let them speak and see what they have to say. If I cannot say it about something about that you earlier you mentioned that it's not going to be a, the a project that will be historical in a way uh, and it's not going to be like like this uh, normative but uh, as the way you put it he actually it, it is historical it it's really has this historical dimension in in a really modern methodological conceptual way because you are not putting the to the um, um, any uh, 
any prejudice and, and anything in the in, into the mouths of your uh, informers and your actors. You would like to see why they did not want to go. Mm. And uh, obviously, we would just like to do it without any prejudices or theory, theory, pro progressed cage of the mm. of the theory. Mm. Which I, I find it very historical, so I'm sorry to say that, but I find you. I find well, you. Well, we can have a second uh, <laughs> debate about the relationship between history and memory studies, yes. and then we can. Yes, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it is. It the was question, slightly of course, provocative, it's, but it's, it was it's, also praising your approach. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but but definitely, and I mean, of course, it will bring some data. I think that at least. Um, I hope I will help uh, fellow fellow historians maybe at least just put at one place all of these reports that we have so far um, and see what is really um, out there and it won't be possible to do it without having the historical. But that's why I'm starting here. <laughs> Thank you. And <laughs> you're looking forward to your results. Thank you. Yeah, we'll see about that. Somebody needs to give the money. <laughs> 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 Another question? No? No. So on this specific no. ending, uh, Marco nicely ended the event. So thank you all for coming. And yeah, event is not going to end now, but it will end with uh, the coffee. With but the that's, coffee. that's something that I wanted to stay silent for the people on the Zoom. But <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks.